May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, gathered in his, God's house to bask in his glory, which is revealed to you through his word and in his sacraments. As I mentioned earlier, the message or the por portion of God's word that we're going to be studying this morning is the gospel lesson. If you want to have that open and kind of follow along through the text as we, we go through that, I'd encourage it. It's written in John chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. It's the wedding at Cana. I want you to kind of know where this is headed from the beginning, so I'm, I'm going to ask two questions that I kind of want you to mull in your mind as we work through this gospel lesson. And these questions are here. Why did the Holy Spirit inspire this account of Jesus turning water into wine to be included in the gospel record of Jesus' ministry? That's the first question. And what does it have to do with you? That's the second. So think about that now as we work through the gospel lesson. St. John tells us that uh, it was on the third day that a wedding in Cana of Galilee took place. It happened. What does that mean, on the third day? Well, there's some debate about that. It could mean on the third day of the week, which would be about Tuesday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Or if you're following along in John's Gospel, it could be the third day after Jesus arrived back in Galilee. And perhaps that was one of the reasons for him to go back to Galilee, because as we learn, he had been invited to this wedding. But we don't really know which it would be. We can't tell from the text which it would be. What's sufficient for us to understand, though, is that John, who was an eyewitness of this account, or, or this event, he knew. And what he's telling us is that this really happened at this particular location, this little town of Cana in Galilee, and it happened on a specific day. And people who knew, people who were familiar with it, would be able to say, yeah, that really happened. We were there. That's when that wedding happened. No doubt that wedding celebration would have been would have gone on for more than just a day or an evening like many of ours do. Culturally, weddings then lasted for a few days, sometimes, as we learn, almost up to a week or more. And it's doubtful that the count then continues with day one of the wedding. Because in that culture, if you were planning for a wedding and you knew you had guests coming, you would make sure to have plenty of wine on hand to meet the needs of your guests. And, and, and given some of the words that we hear later from what I call the maitre d' or the, the wedding planner later, it, it's very likely that the wedding had gone on for a few days already when suddenly tragedy struck. Tragedy struck because why? They uncorked the last bottle of wine. And the party was still going. Now, I recognize that in our culture, if such a thing happened, it would be a subtle way of saying, hey, time to pack up and go home, right? But, but in this culture, and in, in time of Jesus' day, that was a source of embarrassment and shame to the family and the couple to whom it had happened. Now you might ask, well, how, why did this happen for them, right? Well, perhaps uh, more guests showed up than they were planning. You, you, We've all sent out 100 invitations, and we expect only about 50 people to show up. Well, maybe it happened to them that they sent out, a, you know, how many hundreds of invitations, and 110 people showed up, right? So while you rejoice to have all those guests and people who want to be a part of your celebration, suddenly you recognize the supplies aren't going to last. Or it could just be that they just didn't have the resources to provide more than, than they provided, and the Festival, the celebration went on a little longer than they had planned. <laughs> We're not told. We, we don't know why, but I wouldn't look disparagingly at the couple for like lack of planning or something like that. For, for whatever the, the, the indication was, they ran out of wine. Nevertheless, Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
who, who certainly had been invited as a guest, it seems to have had some insider information. She, she might, might have been very good friends with the families, or one of the families, and kind of heard the gossip and the scuttlebutt behind the, the scenes, so she knew that what had happened. Or maybe, in addition to be invited to the wedding, she had been asked to help. We, we understand that. We do with, that with our relatives, don't we? We ask them to help out when we have an event. And so for whatever reason, though, Mary's got this insider information. They're, they've run out of wine. That last bottle has been uncorked. Uh-oh, what are we going to do? This tragedy of great embarrassment is a brew. Again, it's, it is a source of great embarrassment and shame for the couple and for their families, but I don't think we'd still rate that as a third world problem, right? That, that wasn't life or limb in danger. That wasn't, you know, starvation or dying of thirst. It wasn't one of those problems. I think even though it's serious, we'd still call it a first world problem, wouldn't we? It, it would be embarrassing, but it certainly would not be life ending. And so Mary, nevertheless, brings that request to Jesus. But notice it's not stated in a request. She's just simply stating a fact. They've run out of wine. Now that would be an interesting fact. Now they've run out of wine. Great, time to pack up and let's go, right? Party's over. Mm, again, not in this day. They've run out of wine. That's embarrassing for them. Jesus understands that behind the statement is a request. You've got to do something about this, right? Something needs to be done. However you take care of it, we, we can't let them suffer this great embarrassment. And Jesus responds then by saying what? Woman, what does that have to do with, with me? Why, I mean, why are you telling me this? What am I supposed to do about this? He said, my hour has not yet come. What does he mean? My hour to reveal my glory has not come yet. Was Jesus telling the truth? I mean, we know what he's about ready to do. We've read the rest of the story. Was he telling the truth? Well, yes. Up to that point, Jesus' hour to reveal his glory had not yet come. But I think there's something else behind it. I think Jesus here, like he does very often in, in the, some of the other gospel accounts, stretches the people who've come to him with a request. And he doesn't do that for his benefit or for their benefit, but for the benefit of everybody else around them. Jesus is giving Mary an opportunity to express her faith in him. G Mary's response to Jesus' words to her demonstrated her great faith. Because what did she say? Jesus seems to be putting her off, but she's not going to be put off. She simply turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. Where did Mary come by that faith? Well, you remember Mary? She's the one who had taken all these things the angel had said to her, the things she had witnessed and seen, the things that Simeon had said to her. Of course, she was there at the birth of Jesus. Uh, that She was there at the, when he was 12 years old. And they lost him for three days. They had to go back and find him in the temple. And she pondered all those things in her heart. And you've got to imagine now that this is 30 years later after the birth, roughly, She's had a lot of things to ponder in her heart. No doubt there have been some very interesting discussions in that home. It's discussions she's had with her own son, whom she's already confessed as her savior. So Mary's not acting in ignorance here. She knows who Jesus is. She knows why Jesus has been sent into the world. Simeon made that abundantly clear. He was sent here to die, to save sinners, the angel said. And Mary knew that he had just been down Transjordan in the south being baptized by John. He had just come back to Galilee. He had some disciples with him. She's putting it together. He said, well, he must about, she must be about to begin his earthly ministry. And then the things that the prophets had said he would do to reveal himself like heal and help in miraculous ways would start to happen. She didn't know when. But she knew that those things had to happen. See, so great is her faith that she simply tells the servants, who she probably had dragged there with herself, to say, 
do whatever he tells you to do. Now, brothers and sisters, is that how you approach Jesus in your prayer life? Do you approach your Father in heaven with that same kind of confidence of faith? Do, do you, when you ask for something, then anticipate and expect the response to that prayer request? Or are we more like what G James, the brother of Jesus, chides us for being? And that is, we go and talk to God because we think that's what God wants to hear from us. But we don't really trust he's going to give us anything we've asked for. And then we wonder why we didn't get anything. And that's because God doesn't reward unbelief. It's quite simple. Jesus here, as we're going to learn, in a sense you could say rewards, graciously rewards Mary for her faith. He's responding to her faith. God responds to faith. So when you bring your prayers to God, when you bring your request to Jesus, like Mary, anticipate and expect a response. If you've prayed for rain, then confidently carry your umbrella, even if it's sunshine outside. If you've asked for something of Jesus in your home, in your family, then warn your spouse and your children to do whatever he tells them to do. If, like me, you've been praying for God to work through the gospel and gather more people here in our community around the gospel to hear it and learn it, then you have to expect and you have to prepare for those guests to arrive. That, brothers and sisters, is what God encourages us to do to step out in faith, to trust the one you've asked. Trust his heart. Trust what you know about him. Now, without any delay that we can detect, Jesus, no doubt, feeling the eyes and the ears of those servants just hanging on him, tells them, go fill the big water jars with water. So they did. They began drawing water and filling these large jars. That John tells us these were the kind of large jars that held the water, that they used to wash people's feet. Remember how they used to wash people's feet because you didn't want to bring stinky feet into the house, things like that. So this, this was the, these were the jars that were used to hold that kind of water. Now they're rather large. John says each one between 20 and 30 gallons. So they, they probably look something about like this. And no doubt, because you can't hoof that much water around in a big jar, it's, they were probably using smaller jars and it took time to fill that. Now you're probably quickly doing the math in your head going, well, I'm going to say that, well, it's 180 gallons if they were each about 30 gallons. Now, looking ahead a little bit, that's a lot of wine, isn't it? It's a lot of water, but it's a lot of wine. And then Jesus instructed them, the uh, servants, draw some of the, the water out of those jars and take it to the mater d'. We might today call him the wedding planner, <laughs> the invent, someone who's in charge of running the show behind the scenes. Okay? And she takes it to the head steward, and the steward tastes now this water, which had been turned into wine and recognizes that this was not Franzia from a box. This was the most exquisite wine. It's the best he had tasted. And he's so stunned by this that he has to inform the bridegroom that this is just out of, the, out of anyone's experience, that you would serve the very best, the most exquisite wine, so late in the celebration. You would have started with that in the first day or two. And then you would have worked down to the, the Franzi in a box, maybe, huh? But, but it was just the opposite. Now, apparently, from those comments, only Jesus, of course, and then Mary and the disciples and the servants were in on the miracle. Nevertheless, what, what Jesus does here is a most tremendous and, and thoughtful wedding gift, isn't it? I don't know, we don't even know if the couple ever finds out. Maybe, since somebody had to know that they had run out of wine, but Jesus, in this very thoughtful gift, not because it was of the, of the quality of it, not, not just because of the quantity of it, but because of the purpose of it. The gift to the couple was to spare them from that first world issue of shame and embarrassment. Now, it, was, it would do far more than that, but 
for the couple, that's what it did. It had spared them from shame and embarrassment. Now, wouldn't you agree then that this account that the Holy Spirit has inspired to be recorded in the record gives us just beautiful insight. It's heartwarming insight into the heart and soul of our Savior. He is never ashamed to associate with sinners the likes of you or me. He's not ashamed to join with us in our celebrations. And nor has it ever been beneath him to save us. Not from fourth world problems, not even from first world problems. In fact, that's why he had come into the world, isn't it? He had come into the world to save us from what I like to call the fourth world problems. See, this goes beyond the third world problems of, you know, where you're going to find water, where you can find shelter, food, clothing, and those very basic things. Those are real problems. But this is even more than that. Fourth world problems are your damnable sins that are going to lead you to death and ultimately into hell and that subject you to the control of the evil one, the devil. Jesus came to save you, not just from fourth world problems or third world, but all of them. Four through one. So, let's ask the questions again. Why do you think the Holy Spirit inspired this account of Jesus turning water into wine to be included in the gospel record of Jesus' ministry? Do you have an idea now? Then, what does that have to do with you? If you're not sure, let's just keep looking to the end of the account here. This is the last verse in chap, uh, chapter 2, not chapter 2, but of our account. It's verse 11. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now the Holy Spirit's telling you why he's put this in the written record of Jesus' ministry. As Jesus noted earlier, his hour had not yet come, and now apparently it had come, and it was the first. He had never done miracles before this. We heard about that last week in worship. There, there aren't any little cute stories of lifting furniture and you know healing kids' owies and things when he was younger. There was none of that. This was the first. Now why would the Holy Spirit write that for us? Because the Holy Spirit knows that there are going to be a bunch of crazy people writing a bunch of crazy things about Jesus that aren't true. This is the first. Now why did Jesus do it? He tells us, to reveal his glory. Glory is what? To reveal his divine power and glory. So why? Because by revealing his divine power and glory, he would validate his claim to be the Messiah and Savior. And for that reason, the disciples put their faith in him. Now you see again why the Holy Spirit wants that account written in the, in the Bible. Because he wants people to believe in Jesus. You may be aware, that is the stated purpose of John's gospel. John writes this for us in chapter 20, toward the end of a gospel. He said, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So there are way more miracles than we even know about. But these, including this first one, are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. Not just life in the future, but life right now in Jesus' name. This miracle of turning water into wine revealed Jesus' true identity. It revealed that Jesus is God just as he claimed. He wants you also to believe in him, to put your trust in him, because he knows that by believing in him, you are saved. You have life. Yes, you have eternal life in heaven, sealed up and gifted to you, but you also, brothers and sisters, have life right now. And how is that possible? 
because Jesus, the Son of God, is absolutely the only one who could and did save you. Through his life, through everything he said and did and didn't do, he saved you through his suffering and death because he took on your shame and your sin and he endured the punishment of that and he endured the death because of that. He gave himself over to death for you. But he did it also so that he could rise again victorious to give you the hope of eternal life, a resurrection at the last day and an eternal life. So you see, in that doing that, Jesus has saved you from the fourth world problems, hasn't he? He's taken away your sin. He's taken away your guilt and your shame and your embarrassment over those sins. He's taken away your death. He's taken away control from the devil. He's taken away hell. But you also need to know that the Son of God cares for you even now. Jesus tells us, it makes a promise to us in Matthew that he will always be with us, even to the very end of the age. So that would mean all of us. Adults, children, everybody. Jesus is always with us. It, it, it means he's with us at our family events and gatherings. He doesn't feel belittled or ashamed to join us at our life celebration events, whatever those may be. He's not embarrassed or ashamed to be with us even when we've been shamed and embarrassed, often because of the things we've done. He's not ashamed to be with us in our alone times. He's not ashamed or belittled to have to sit with us and hold our hands when we are sick and suffering. And he knows just how and how often Life in a sinful world has affected and afflicted us. And yet, in spite of everything he knows about us, our shameful thoughts and, and those horribly embarrassing sins, in spite of all of that, he still cares for you. He will do whatever you need him to do to save you. He's already demonstrated that, hasn't he? He's already just demonstrated by going to the cross for you and suffering hell for you that he would do anything to save you. That's, that's why he came into the, the world, isn't it? To save you. And that's what, he's, that's, that's what he's always wanted to do. That's what he's always worked to do. Now, that doesn't always mean that he's going to provide you the $150 bottle of wine flowing from your tap at home, right, so you have something to drink with dinner tonight. But it does mean that he will answer your prayers, and he will either save you from those embarrassing and, and those, all those other world problems, or he will save you through them. But he will save you. And that's what he assures us. Through his word and sacraments, he convinces you that he loves and cares for you. Not just your soul, but your body too. You doubt that? Well, within, in him and with him, you never have cause to feel shame or embarrassment. He's not ashamed or embarrassed to be your brother your Lord, your Savior, who is always with you. Again, do you doubt that? Yeah, I think all of us at some level, because we have unbelief as part of our natural sinful condition, still lives in those unbelief, that, that old sinful nature that's still a part of us. We struggle with that sometimes, don't we? It, it's difficult to offer prayers to God, fully trusting that he will do what we've asked. Because that unbelief still lives in the heart. And our prayer would be what? Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. You know how he does that? He does that through another miracle. Through the miracle of when he joins his body and blood to bread and wine and he invites you to his table. And he gives you those things as a gift and assures you that with these I have forgiven your sins. With these, I have secured peace in your heart. 
With these I have washed away your guilt, your shame, and your embarrassment. With these I have strengthened your grip on eternal life. And with these I have put joy in your heart and praise on your lips. That's how Jesus reveals his glory to you today, through his word and through his sacraments. And he's revealed his glory to sinners like you to save you. Believe it and bask in his glory. Let's pray about that, shall we? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this account of your first miracle at the wedding in Cana, for the miraculous way in which you showed care and concern for this, this, uh, these newlyweds, but also for the way you revealed your glory to us, to demonstrate to us that you love us completely, body and soul, that you came to save us from all evil, from first world to fourth world problems. We ask that as you continue to, to pour out your love into our hearts, as you continue to reveal your glory to us through your word and in your sacraments, you would strengthen our faith in you, in who you are, and in the things that you promise you will do for us. Give us that strength of faith so that we can come to you like your mother did, with boldness and confidence, asking, trusting, and then anticipating and expecting your response. Lord Jesus, help us to be these kinds of people of faith. In your name we ask it. Amen.